and he looks at me, never heard this before. And he said, you have a problem, man, and you need to go get help. I started the podcast as a selfish way to recover. And honestly, to today, the podcast is still just my recovery tool. I'm, I'm glad people listen and it's fun to talk to everybody and talk about all this. Yeah. But that podcast is my selfish recovery tool and it will remain that. And that's how I, not, that's how I don't gamble, is talking about it. Hello and welcome to the Invisible Addiction Podcast. If you're a new listener, hi, thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to this episode. And of course, if you're a long-time listener of the podcast, I hope you've been keeping well. Shortly, we'll be hearing from the host of another gambling addiction recovery podcast and hearing his gambling addiction story. But before we go any further, I would like to make a short disclaimer and say that this is an informational podcast. If you're experiencing gambling problems, of course, I hope you relate to the stories you hear but please do seek professional help. Links to that support can be found on the Invisible Addiction website, www.theinvisibleaddiction.com forward slash support. Right, without further ado, let's crack on with the podcast. Okay, so joining us on the other end of the line today is Brian Hatch from Connecticut in America. He's come onto the show to share his gambling addiction story with us and to tell us more about All In, the Addicted Gamblers podcast, a podcast he founded in 2015, which, as far as I'm aware, was the first of its kind in the world. Since then, he's hosted nearly 200 episodes with a wide range of guest interviews, from personal stories to speaking to policymakers. I'm a huge fan of his, and so it gives me great pleasure to introduce him to the Invisible Addiction podcast. Brian, how are you doing? Alex Lewis, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure, my friend. Um, so look, before we dive into your story, I wondered if you could give the listeners a quick introduction about your background and experience. Yeah. So I, uh, I grew up in Michigan and I didn't leave Michigan until I was 31. So I still consider Michigan home. And so, uh, you know, growing up there in a cool little neighborhood, had a lot of good friends and Eventually went away to college and uh, was academically dismissed my first year of college. And that is when I started gambling. So you can do the math there. And, you know, since then, I, I'd always been a fan of comedy and I uh, had done some stand up and I was on an improv stage for a few years and I loved it. And that's the career I wanted to pursue. But guess what I loved more? <laughs> gambling. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I can't blame it all on that. I, I still I didn't put the proper amount of work in, but I enjoyed it when I did it and I do miss it. But uh, that's sort of where I want to go. And from there, I was just, you know, I worked in manufacturing for 15 years. So building metal boxes on a bench for 15 years was a good time. And eventually left Michigan, moved out to California, left California, moved to North Carolina where I met my partner and we're married and we have a daughter. I do the podcast while she naps. There we go. You've condensed it into, uh, into, 30 seconds. That was, that was amazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so look, we'll, um, I mean, I'm sure we'll, we'll cover that in, in, in the rest of the podcast and things. Uh, but yeah. gamb gambling, how did it, how did it start? How did it start for you? Well, I'm, I'm as everybody I'm sure tells you prior to being the legal age, I, I gambled with family. We'd play cards, nothing crazy, but I always noticed that I really liked it. Uh, in fact, when I was 17, 17, 18, a senior in high school, was playing a friend in some ping pong. And we played for, I don't know, it was a buck or something. And then we just kept doing double or nothing. And he kept winning and I kept losing. And we got up to like $3,400. And he never made me pay. At, you know, at the end, he was like, that was silly. But the desperation that I remember, like double or nothing, like you just grab the ball and you start a new game and you just go. And that behavior continued into when I started gambling legally in, uh, boy, 2000. Yeah, the year 2000. I was a freshman in college. Some friends wanted to go to the casino, which was a tribal casino in uh, about two and a half hours away from the college I was at. And we all were spread out around the state. So we all sort of met there. And I'd never been to a casino. I'd purchased lottery tickets, but that didn't really do much for me. I'd, you know, I'd done it a few times, but nothing no harm or anything. And then went to this casino, sat around a table playing blackjack with friends, just having a great time, just being around my friends. Noticed I was really enjoying playing blackjack and I didn't know what I was doing. You know, 
certain rules to blackjack. None of us were following them. We we're all just playing with each other. So we weren't affecting anybody else. Um, I did win that night, which again, I'm sure everybody tells you that's where you sort of, it clicks and you go, Oh, I won. Oh, I'm going to come back. Yeah. Trouble is I started going back the two and a half hour trip up to uh, Mount Pleasant, Michigan from Ypsilanti, Michigan. Uh, I had a girlfriend at the time who went to Michigan state. So I would drive the hour and 10 minutes to Michigan state, hang out. And then I would say, Oh, I have to go to work in the morning. So I got to drive back. But what I would do was drive up to the casino and go play blackjack all night long till four in the morning, drive back down to Ypsilanti to two and a half hours, illegally park in my dorm parking lot. Cause we weren't supposed to park there, go in and take a shower and then go straight to work. Cause I had a full-time job, which again was a stupid move as a freshman in college. But uh, yeah, so that was my start to it. I ended up, uh, I ended up not going to class ever because I was either sleeping from gambling all night or I would skip class, you know, to go to work. I ended up getting a second job my freshman year hmm. of college as well, which again, what am I doing? What am I, what am I going to think I'm going to go to school in all this time? Uh, so I was gambling pretty regularly and then just realized, oh my gosh, I've, I've done a lot of harm in this gambling. I'm financially messed up already. I'm only 18. I didn't even have a credit card, but I, uh, I ended up calling, excuse me. I ended up calling the, uh, 800 number at that time. I don't remember which one it was, but uh, I did under the guise of, Hey, I'm writing a paper for my class. And I was just wondering if you could send me some info. So they sent the info to my dorm and I remember reading the 20 questions and I went, Oh, Oh yeah, this is me. This is me. I, I definitely know that I have an addiction to gambling at this moment in time. However, you don't want to stop. I didn't want to stop. Mm. So, you know, I sort of ignored it. And in that time period too, I only had so much money, so I couldn't gamble all the time. But anytime I did have money, I was gambling. And at the end of my freshman year, I was academically dismissed because I never went to class and had to move back home with my parents mm. and tell them, hey, I got kicked out of college. Mm. And here I am. And that would not be the last time that I moved back home with my parents. I was going to say, I, I, I know we've spoken before and I mean, there's always stories that you relate to, but I can relate to your story a lot, um, certainly with the moving in, like with your parents and things. Um, just, to, just to clarify, tribal casino, casinos, what, what, what are tribal casinos? Uh, so Native Americans have casinos in Michigan. I mean, they have them all over the United States. They have a, mm. They're allowed to have casino licenses mm. that are separate from any public availability licenses. Mm. And so Michigan didn't have public casinos till I think 99, 2000. And then mm. three casinos moved into Detroit, which I ended up going to. And the tribal casinos now have 23 casinos to give you an idea of how many casinos there are. Mm. So the different tribes can start up a casino. I, I don't know the general specifics of it. I, mm. I, I wasn't interested in that part of it when I was there. I was, no. just walked in and it was a, it was a, just a lovely place to visit and there's a college right there too where mount pleasant where this casino is soaring eagle there's central michigan university is there and it was the only casino that you could gamble at 18 in, mm. in michigan so you got a whole college worth of kids who can go down the street and gamble while they're at schools so that that always weirded me out if i'm glad i didn't live up there because i would have been there all the time mm. i was gonna say um what so what attracts you to to the casinos per se what was it about the casinos that you thought, you know what, I need to be here? The, f the, f the feeling of the excitement and anticipation of going was really, that was enough. And then you get to do the act that you're anticipating. And, you know, you win and your brain goes, ooh, I like this. And so you think you can do it more. And, and honestly, part of me thought, why am I working and going to school? I should just gamble and quit my job and go to school. Hmm. I mean, that, that was a thought I had, which is just ridiculous to even consider after one night. And I proved that I was wrong about that because I kept going and eventually had to leave college because of it. But, I, you know, the lights and the sounds. I started playing blackjack and then I was in Canada gambling because you could gamble at 19 there. And Canada's right across from Detroit. And so I was going to Casino Windsor playing blackjack. And then one night I was at a table with some people. 
and one guy yelled at another guy. And I thought, this is really messing with this vibe that I feel at the casino, right? I'm there to relax, not to talk to anybody and get that drug that I'm taking. And these guys were yelling at each other. I thought, I'm out of here. I don't want to sit. Plus, blackjack takes a long time Mm -hmm. for everyone to go through. And I just needed something faster. So I moved to roulette. And that kind of sufficed that faster play. Mm -hmm. Now, when you got six people at a roulette table, that's also annoying. Eventually, I moved to slots because nobody can get my way there. And I can just sit there and go as fast as I want to. So that's, you know... Also, I, I smoked. So being able to sit inside a casino, and at that time, bars were starting to do away with smoking inside. And so you could still go to a casino, sit down. I would smoke a cigarette, put my money in, and I was so relaxed up until the point, of course, where you're desperate and going to the ATM, going to the credit card machine and getting more money. Uh, but I, it, was, it, it was nice to be around people, but also not to have to interact with them. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed, there's people off in the distance, but I'm sitting here isolated and alone and just giving myself pleasure. That sounds weird, but just giving myself pleasure Mm -hmm. while I'm at this slot machine. And so that was always the appeal. If I felt alone at home, I could go there because there's people there. I don't need to interact, but I felt like I was at least around people. So I was no longer lonely. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. I'm I'm trying to think of the... um... Oh, the famous rock and roll singer. Is it Lenny or Lemmy? I can never get that right. Lemmy? Yeah. Lemmy. It's Lemmy. Yeah, Motorhead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you seen some space? <laughs> yeah. Have you, have you, I don't know if you've seen the documentary of his. Le- I think it's literally called yeah. Lemmy. And he's yeah, just. Yeah, he goes down in the, I think it's the Rainbow Room. That's it. And he's playing the fruit machine, basically. Yeah. That's but the it's, one. Uh, it, it's one. I think you just put money in, but you don't win anything. Hmm. Hmm. I think yeah. it's I think it's that, isn't he? And he's just, and he's just I just you know he's just sitting oh, like chain smoking. smoking, and that's the it, that's the imagery I got in in, in my head when he described oh, that situation. Man. Now I've got that song in my head. That documentary is great. <laughs> Lemmy's fascinating. Yeah, he is. Anybody listening should definitely check him out. Um, yeah. You know, one thing I didn't do a lot when I gambled was drink, mm. and I I'm a drinker, but I I just didn't. A I didn't want to waste any money on alcohol because I knew I needed it to gamble, uh, but B. And, and the biggest thing, I didn't want to get up to go to the bathroom. And that's a weird sort of mindset. I'd have a beer. I'd have like one beer. But I didn't want to get up and go to the bathroom. Either because somebody would take the machine I was on and maybe I liked that. But also, you know, it's just time away. I don't want to do that. So I, I really did not drink a lot. I mean, on a few occasions I did. But when I gambled, I would just chain smoke and, and take in the atmosphere. So kind of strange did you drink when you were gambling well again sorry to just be like oh um, we're so similar but I mean, no, <laughs> it's like we're I very was, similar well we you're are much better we're... looking though than i am oh I'm, brian oh, i'm brian. turning into an old man you got like you, you got yeah but you got the voice you got the voice you've got the voice i think that's I, to me this just sounds like this nasally kid from when i was little that i <sighs> You just, you just got such a, such a good voice. <laughs> oh, thank you. We need to, we need to, we need to get a room, guys. Oh wait, we have got a room. Um, yeah, no, we're doing okay. a podcast in it. Yeah, yeah, about, but I need to focus, 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 focus. Right. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Um, no, I didn't, I didn't drink that much. Like you say, I, I would just have a beer because, like you say, I just wanted to be at the tables. But I would actually, having said that, I would accept free drinks. Did, did you do that as well? Like, would you accept free drinks? So Vegas was the only place I was aware of that was giving away free drinks at that time. And I didn't go to Vegas till I was 23 for the first time. So, you know, the casinos I was gambling in for the first two, three years, you have to be 21. I have to be 21 to drink, but I could be 18 to gamble. Um, I will say, though, in Canada, when I would go there, because that I did go to Canada with some people because you could drink at 19. A lot of us were going over the border to drink. And for whatever reason the story you always gave was we're going to the casino, even no matter what you're doing, they always said, just say at the border that you're going to the casino. And I always thought, well, I am going to the casino. I don't care who I'm going to Canada with. I'm going to end up in that casino. Uh, So I did drink there, but um, no free drinks there. It was all, it was all money. It wasn't until Vegas that I experienced a free drink and I went, Oh, okay. Well maybe I will drink a little bit if it's free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, they got their money's worth out of me, but (laughs) there's no free drink. Yeah, right. I was going to say, I mean, I've, I've 
I'm fascinated by Vegas. I've never been. I've never been. Could you? Don't go. <laughs> right, there we go, there we go. Yeah, yeah. If we're that similar, don't go. go. You don't want any <laughs> yeah. part of that. It, uh, yeah. If, uh, if yeah. you think lights and sounds are amazing, wait till you go to that place. Oh, God. Yeah. I was going to I ask. mean, it is. Yeah. It, there is something romantic, I think, about Las Vegas in, in the way that it's that old wise guy Vegas type atmosphere and to see it in person. But it is, it, it's, like a, it's like a sinful Disneyland. Mm. And, you know, I'm not judging anybody for going there and doing anything. Go do it. If you can gamble without harm, go do it. It's fun. Um, but for people like me, and actually, you know, we'll get to it, but Vegas was the last place I placed a bet. There we go. Strangely enough. Yeah. There we go. There we go. So, so Brian, where should we pick up your story? You, you, were, you were in at university or college, as you would say. Uh, where should we pick this story up? Should we pick, pick so it up from re- there? I have to remember my audience. I will say football, not soccer. Don't worry. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So I'd moved back home and, and, and worked and, you know, gambling here and there, but still hiding it. Nobody knew I was, I was gambling as much as I was. And then eventually, uh, my friend Chris and I got an apartment together. He also went to his freshman year of college and just sort of willy nilly his way through it. And he, he left as well. So we both sort of returned home to our small hometown and then, uh, gone back out, got an apartment back in Ypsilanti. And that was fun. I felt like an adult again. Like, all right, back out on my own. Here we go. And, you know, then it was a lot easier. I was closer to the casino. And there was, even though I was an adult, my parents were still aware that I was around. So this was great because nobody was watching me. And then it, it got out of hand at the point where I got fired from this job that I told you I worked at for 15 years. I did get fired from that. I went back eventually, but I got fired. And that was my uncle's company. So when I got fired from there in the family, it was a little bit like, what happened? And it was because I was, I was out every night, you know, at that age, uh, after 21, I was either at a bar or I was at the casino for the most part, um, or working two jobs, which I did as well for a, a good, portion of my 20s but at the point where i got fired i thought okay maybe this is the time to get my life back together uh my grandfather who i was very close with uh i would go down and visit him once a week and so i was there and i said hey listen i want to go back to school and i need to ask you a favor can i borrow some money because as you know i messed up my freshman year and my mom and dad were not going to give me any more money to go to school so he agreed and the, the way we were going to do the money was uh, just a small loan, um, not from him, but uh, a student loan. So mm. I just needed somebody to co-sign the loan. And so I went, I went there to hit him up to co-sign the loan. And he did. And then later, he was reading the fine print. Excuse me, I'm sorry. <clears throat> later, he was reading the fine print, and he noticed the interest. And he said, this is stupid. Why don't I just give you the money? Mm. You send the check back then you're not on the hook for that. And I said, that's a great idea. And uh, so what happened is in two nights, I lost the loan money and the money he loaned me for school. Now I had paid for school. It was community college. So you're just paying for classes and books. And I was taking three classes. So I took a $4,000 loan and he gave me 4,000. I only spent 1,200 of it on the school part. And I remember sitting in the parking lot one day of school and I thought I don't want to go in and I drove to the casino Um, but getting back to the night where I gambled away the money that I stole from my grandfather uh, you know that was that was really hard that was one of those nights I look back at and I go oh wow that's that's a Mm. big sign right there Mm. because then I thought well now I'm out the loan money so I have to pay that and his name is attached to it so it's not like he's not gonna know Mm. Also, I don't have the money he gave me. So I don't know what my story is going to be. Uh, he never found out anything. They ne- I mean, I, I paid the loan payment. So he never knew that I had not returned the money and that I had gambled away any of it. But that night when I lost, you know, night number two, MGM Casino in Detroit, the second night of losing that $8,000, um, I didn't know what to do. I panicked. And this was... This was probably the closest I'd ever come to, to causing myself harm, physical harm. 
Mm. And that was because I was in such a panic, but I was also conscious that consciously um, breathing heavily to induce some reaction from my body. I wanted to go to the ER because I, I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but if someone's worried about me, they're not going to judge what I just did, right? If, if, I, if I'm in some sort of peril or danger and maybe my thought process was they're not going to judge me for stealing if I'm hurt, mm. which is like that tells you right away my brain was not correct at all. I, that wasn't the behavior I should have been exhibiting. Um, so I did this breathing thing and I sort of induced basically a panic attack. But I called my mom from the car at the height of this panic attack. So then she would worry. And then when I called her, because of all the heavy breathing I was doing, I couldn't talk properly. My mouth was very awkward. And she, honest to God, over the phone thought I was having a stroke. And so she said, go to the ER. And I said, okay. And I went and they met me there, my parents. And, you know, I'm telling this story and I'm realizing the stories that come later. And I, going to get emotional. Uh, they, they met me there and, and the doctor came back and he said, you know, you're okay. It was, you're fine. It was a panic attack. Is everything okay with you? And I said, yeah, 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 uh, good. Uh, so I drove home and didn't tell them what had happened. I just, you know, they believed it was a panic attack. Uh, went to home to my apartment, whatever. Anyway, another night comes up and I, Chris comes to the casino with me, a rare occasion where a friend comes to the casino with me. Uh, Chris is one of my best friends in the world. And that night, Chris likes to drink. He likes, he's the guy who can gamble for entertainment. He can go and spend $20 and that's fine. He'll throw away his $20. He doesn't care. If he won, you know, 50 cents, he'd be like, look at me. Yeah. So we went and I was, you know, he had no idea what kind of money I was gambling, but I had emptied my bank account. And then of course the over withdrawal that you can always inevitably do. And I did that. And then he was drunk and I convinced him that I could win. Could I have his ATM card? And he was, he was inebriated. And I mean, sure to this day, he'll tell you like, Oh yeah, I knew what I was doing, but he was very drunk. And I straight up asked him for his ATM card and, and the pin. Mm -hmm. And so I took whatever was left in his account, I think about 400 bucks, lost it. We're walking out of, the, we're walking in the parking structure. We had just left the double doors. We're about 10 steps away from the doors. And he looks at me, never heard this before. And he said, you have a problem, man. And you need to go get help. And I like, I'm sitting here going, wow, I've gotten away with so much and nobody knows anything. Meanwhile, he's watching everything. And he said, you need to get help. And, and the man saved my soul. I, I called uh, to find out where a meeting was. I went to my first GA meeting when I was 24 years old mm. and the meeting was, it wasn't the ideal meeting for somebody going to their first meeting. The three other people in the meeting, two females and a male, all of them, I would say about 20 years older than me, but I just, I didn't feel welcomed. I didn't feel comfortable and mm. that's not their fault, but I just, that was the feeling I had. So the next week I drove to the meeting and sat in the parking lot and I watched people go and I went, oh, there's more people this week, which just got me more nervous. So I drove yeah. away. Yeah. The next week I lied that I went to the meeting. I literally left my apartment when Chris was there. So that way he thought I was going. Um, and I didn't have any money at this time. I mean, I was really running low. And I think at this point, I was back to work at my job because the guy who fired me then got fired. So then the guy who liked me called me and hired me back. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I think my uncle was no longer the owner of the company anyway. So I was back to that job working, but I, I was gambling because I didn't go back to G. I started gambling again. You know, you're living on peanut butter and rice because you can't afford anything else. And you got to make sure that you pay your rent because I'm splitting that with Chris. And mm -hmm. if he knows that I don't have rent because I'm gambling, he's going to kick my ass. So that went on for about a year and a half. And I then went to my second GA meeting when I was 26. Wow. One sixteen oh nine, January 16th of 2009 right. was my first official meeting, I would say. And it was a different, I went to a different town and it was a lovely meeting. Great group of people in there. Um, 
I still remember them fondly today. I still quote some of them today. Hmm. So uh, it was just a really great meeting that at that time, again, saved my soul. Two and a half years, I, I, I was in the GA rooms. Wow. And for whatever reason, one day, I just decided, you know what? I'm tired. I'm not going go to I'm not gonna go to the meeting tonight. Hmm. And at this point, I, uh, you know, because I skipped a few years, but in that, in that time period, I had moved back in with my parents again. I had confessed to my parents that I had a gambling addiction. I mean, I was bawling. My mom was crying. Mm -hmm. My dad's just sitting there going, whoa. Um, but they were, they were lovely again. They're like, get your life back on track. You know, stop gambling, get your life back on track, go to your GA meetings. And I did. So as I said, two and a half years, and then I got complacent. And after, you know, four weeks of not going, I sort of said, well, now that I'm not going, I kind of want to gamble. And I had put enough time away from gambling. And this happened periodically. I would go months without gambling, you know, six months here, six, you know, finances. But also, if I don't feel like it, I won't go. That's, that's good. I'm, I'm doing this myself. I can do it without anybody. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you know, moved out, got my own apartment. Uh, Chris actually ended up joining the Navy. So he wasn't going to be my roommate anymore. And uh, he got his life on track. And then, you know, uh, after some after some bad experiences, I uh, ended up moving back in with my parents a third time at the age of 29. Mm -hmm. uh, to sort of tell you what this bad experience was, you know, I told you I I I drink. Uh, I was working. 96 hours a week in order to not gamble i got three jobs but also to pay back myself for all this money i had lost mm -hmm. and to pay back those around me who i had lied to and borrowed money from and all that so i decided oh, i'm gonna work three jobs i'm gonna do this 96 hours a week is a lot mm -hmm. i had one spot of time a week where i could do something fun and i went out with the co-workers from the sunday job i was from this weekend job i was working on sunday night this little four-hour block and I was dating one of the girls from that job. And we all started drinking and she sort of acted uh, kind of, all of a sudden I was like, eh, maybe I don't really like you. And I was kind of upset, I, it, completely unreasonable on my part. Mm. Uh, but I left in a huff. And at that time I had borrowed my grandmother's car to drive around because I had a, had a Mustang GT, which I don't know why I bought that again. Like I made so many stupid decisions financially. That didn't even have to do with gambling. I was just like, I want it. I'm going to get it. I can afford it. I couldn't afford it. But I couldn't drive it in the winter, which made it even stupid. I mean, dumber when you're in Michigan with snow. And so I borrowed my grandmother's car. It hadn't been driven in five years, but she let me borrow it for the winter. And I left in a huff and I was going down the highway and the back left wheel broke off the car. The whole wheel broke off the car. I was going 75. I was in the left lane. The car kicked sideways. And then the car flipped over. And then all I remember is dirt and stuff in my face. And then I woke up. I was on the outside of the car. I immediately, because I can still see it in my head, I immediately was looking all over because I thought for sure I killed somebody. I thought for sure I caused something bad. And I was like, this is not great for me. Um, so I woke up and, and nobody had been hurt. I looked around. No cars had even stopped. And it was midnight and there was snow. And I thought, I didn't know the back wheel had fallen off the car. I just, you know, like, what the hell am I doing on the outside of the car? So the police came and I've always been somebody, I will cop to it right away. Police came and I said, I was at a bar. I'm so sorry. I, I, I made, I'm, this was wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, you know, the cop appreciated it. But I was at a bar. And then one of the firemen said to me like, oh, we got a call about you. And it was literally like, an exit and a half, two exits away. So I, I, you know, whether they got a call or not, but I woke up in the ditch. And, uh, when I was talking to the police officer and told him what had happened, he said, so how did you get out of the car? And I said, well, I don't, I woke up outside of the car. What are you talking about? He goes, Oh, well then you gotta go to the hospital. You can't <laughs> basically, he's like, I can't arrest you. You have to go to the hospital. And I was like, Oh, okay. And went to the hospital. And I, at that point, like, the gravity of what just occurred, gravity of what just happened occurred to me. And I remember being in the ambulance and I just start crying, 
because it was just like, like look at where I'm at. Mm-hmm. I, I, I can't believe it got to this this point. Uh, thank God nobody else was hurt, but my hand was kind of. I thought my hand was broken, but it turned out it wasn't. But as they brought me in the ER, I remember I was apologizing to every single person who worked on me. Yeah. Like I was just apologizing. I'm bawling. And then, of course, because of the drinking and driving, they send a social worker in to talk to you and, like, you know, what's going on? And I said, I was working too many hours and I got angry and I got behind the wheel and I was working too many hours because I was gambling and, you know, I was just mm-hmm. basically let it all out and it felt good. Mm-hmm. But then I, you know, two in the morning, I had to call my parents who, you know, I did not live with. We were in between times and, you know, two in the morning, they're not thinking that their 29 year old son is going to be calling them saying, uh, you know what? I messed up again. Mm. And, you know, to my dad's credit, he did not judge me. He showed up. He took me to see the car. Cause by that time it was daylight. Um, I was released from you know, they took a state, the police came and took a statement, but they didn't arrest me from that point. Yeah. So we went to go look at the car. And again, I had not known that this wheel fell off. So we went and they said, oh, the back wheel fell off. We went to the towing place where they brought it in. The car was like mangled. And my dad looked at me and he's like, you came out of that? I said, I have no idea. I, I don't know if I, what, what window I went through or what windshield I went through. Um, but, I, you know, for the most part, I was okay. I was bruised all over my body, but that was kind of the worst part of it. I wow. couldn't walk very well. I had a hard time bending or anything. Like everything was just stiff and kind of wow. giant bruise. Uh, but the guy at the towing place said, oh, the, what happened was the back wheel came off. Like it just snapped right off. And it was on, we drove then down the highway to look. And it was on the highway about, I don't know, an eighth of a mile behind where the accident occurred. So. Part of me thinks, I mean, absolutely, I drank and drove and that was wrong. But that wheel broke off and had that wheel not broken off, you know, perhaps I would have made it home. Again, stupid thing to do, but the wheel broke off, which made me feel just at least a little bit better that I wasn't driving recklessly because I remember driving. I remember thinking everything was fine. All of a sudden the car just freaked out. Mm. But because of that, um, I moved (laughs) back home with my parents. And at this point they had retired. So they were living in an apartment uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I had to move in with my parents in their apartment, literally like rooms across the hall. Yeah. And Alex, I, I don't know about you, but in this whole time frame, I had never felt like an adult at all. And this just added to, I'm like, I'm 29. I'm moving back. Like what is becoming of my life? What am I doing? Um, they never judged me. They invited me in. Um, but I was so angry and so sad at, at the point in my life and that you know, I'm 29 living with my parents mm. that I was just a rotten roommate. I was a rotten person to be around and, you know, it's regretful behavior, but that's the, the way I felt. But the good news is I was able to stop gambling. And again, for, I think another two and a half years. Um, yeah. <laughs> let me, yeah. let me give you a moment, Alex. That was a lot of information that I just gave you. No, 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 Brian, Brian, it was, um, it was quite hard to listen to it at parts. I mean, um, yeah, thanks for sharing. It's um, the, the the bit, the car accident, I never, I, I mean, I've listened to one of the podcasts. I don't know if it was selective hearing on or, or what, but um, I don't think I've heard about the car accident in so much detail. Um, do you, I'm going to get a bit like woo-woo here, but do you believe in a higher power? Do you think it was anything to do with that? You were saved that day? I, I, I don't know. Um, that's a nice thought. I grew up Catholic. I always believed in God. And then as I got older, my mom and I just recently had this discussion, which was very strange because she's a Catholic school teacher and absolutely tells me to go to church every week. And she's a lovely woman and I love her to death. But she goes, do you believe in God? And I said, I don't know anymore. Mm. And I think I've let my belief system be affected by the way that other people treat God Mm. and, and treat the idea of him, maybe using him to, to cause pain to somebody or something like that, you know, Mm. um, when you're like, that's not Christian behavior, I see. But anyway, so I I don't know about the higher power, but I will tell you that I had been in two other car accidents, three other car accidents. Uh, one, when junior in high school, a boulder came off a gravel truck and I mean a boulder, um, size of a rugby ball came through the windshield between, uh, my, my other buddy, Jason and I, 
we were we turned a corner we're just driving straight down the road and this boulder comes oh, off this gravel truck like God. i don't know if he hit a bump or what but it bounced out of the gravel truck bounced <sighs> up off the road directly through the middle of us oh my it God. dented the back seat i mean it would have smashed our heads um oh. but it somehow came you know six inches between our two heads my friend was laid back so all he got all the glass on him um oh but i had gosh. put my elbow up to you know i saw it the last second went, ah and luckily just, i kept the car straight but just a freak accident a complete freak, freak accident ac yeah, yeah freak no but i mean i don't know if the the driver was at fault for not having a cover but yeah yeah Nothing ever happened with that. The police never found which company it was because I couldn't like chase them down. I had a giant hole in my car. Yeah. Another time, another time uh, it was winter and snow and I, I hit the cement, you know, the cement wall on like a highway, the edge of it. And usually they put water in front of it, like big barrels of water. This just had a, sort of a metal grate and I hit this thing at 70, 75 and just Whoa. came to a, a dead stop. Wow. And smashed, I mean, I hit my head against the steering wheel, no airbag came out. And, uh, you know, I had a killer headache, probably a concussion, but I tow truck driver drove me home. And again, like another circumstance of, whoa, that, uh, that should have been worse than what it was. Mm. Mm. So, you know, with those two accidents and then this one, I, I don't know, I kind of like, I don't know, maybe I just bounce off cars. I keep teasing my mom. Like, I just keep bouncing off cars. It's fine. I'll probably just, die in a car crash one day. <laughs> indestructible. I mean, I, I actually, it's, I mean, this is going to be really self-indulgent because it's, it's now it's my story, but no, I want it to be your story. But I will just say oh. I could really relate to that Go ahead. because I, I self-sabotaged my relationship with my girlfriend at the time and because of the gambling and I had to move in with my parents. So this is like another tick off the parallel list. Um, but I had a car accident. It wasn't my God. It wasn't anywhere near as bad as you, you know, the car accidents you've just described, but essentially I had a car accident and um, people were stopping up front, you know, I was driving in the car and the, someone was turning to go right and they paused on the brakes, put on the brakes. And then this car behind me, I swear he was on his phone, just came like hurtling through the back of me. And cool. uh, yeah, and similar to your story, like I was bawling my eyes out. I was literally, I literally thought I'd gone mad. I, I, I thought I had a brain injury. I don't know what was going on. I was crying and crying and the ambulance came and, um, yeah, my friend, my friends will know all about it because I then had to wait for the the car accident people to pick pick me up because the, uh, the after after like a, a a checkup the ambulance guy with us was just like yeah he's he's just a bit weird I think, I think. Yeah. Um, you're fine you just yeah just like come on and I think it was just all the emotion that it, obviously I've been you know boiling um, keeping inside of all the gambling all the drugs I was using all the the, the lies everything it was just like one one big explosion and uh yeah i mean my, as i say my friends on facebook will know about it because i then had to wait for the car accident people and um i went and did a facebook live which was i mean you watch it and i'm just like completely i've i've completely lost the plot i'm just like drumming along to the steering wheel and like almost running some sort of i don't know entertainment show from my from my car and i was waiting for like 4 hours so i mean i you know i was doing it to kind of kill time but um, yeah uh yeah gambling car accidents i don't know i don't know what it is must be must be anonymous but uh, yeah i it, just the way of the world those of us who experience harm get a lot of harm experience there we go there we go right enough about me enough about me so brian um i feel like i've got the the pressure for a good question <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that awful thing. I, where I can, if, if you don't have a question, I can, I can tell you the rest of that story. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Yeah, let's do that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so moved in with my parents two and a half years. Uh, I stopped, eventually stopped working the other two jobs. I stopped working one of them immediately and then eventually just got down to the one. And it's the job I worked at until I moved to California. Now, what prompted me to move to California and what prompted my final you know, whether it's a relapse or not, I, I went back to gambling was I was living with my parents. Um, and I was, it was a week before it was April 1st, 2013. So it was a week before my 31st birthday. Uh, my mom texted me at work and was like, Oh, your dad had some chest pain this morning and I'm just going to take him to the hospital. Now my dad, when I was a senior in high school, I got a phone call at high school, you know, from the office because we didn't have cell phones back then and saying you know my mom said you got to come home your dad was just rushed to the hospital and what happens is he had an aortic dissection where the aorta 
like it balloons up and then it splits open and starts bleeding internally. Generally kills somebody. They caught it in time, saved his life. This time it happened again. Wasn't so lucky. I uh, went to the hospital and like literally walked in this hospital room and they, like, there's 20 doctors around my dad. Uh, and my mom was standing there and I had, it was just her and I, and like, it was just like, you could see it was over. Um, mm. I'm going to start crying. Uh, so they're doing the CPR and whatever. And he's like, this is the image I can never get out of my head is he's naked. Like his whole body's naked. I mean, they have a sheet over him, but he's, he's just naked cause they were cutting him and trying whatever and poking and prodding. Yeah. But I had just gotten there and, uh, he was gone. My mom went up and whispered something to him and he just died right then and there. So, you know, naturally, tragedy. Uh, how do you deal with that pain? So uh, I, I actually dealt with it pretty well at first. That day, that literal day was a Monday and I went to GA on Mondays. So I went to my meeting. I made sure to go to my meeting. And I remember like just walking in a fog and I sat down next to lovely person um who i really admired and, and and she was always very kind to me um but i also felt comforted by her so i just you know i told the room what had happened and that was really weird to say out loud but uh and i i, I made you know i was like i'm here because i don't I, like this is gonna make me go gamble i don't want to uh and i think gosh i don't know how many months it was later but i I, I did gamble and I've since looked back at that gambling. And at the time, you know, I, th I think you hear tragedy and you go, oh, he gambled. He was trying to comfort himself. But I look back and I think there was something sinister at play. I think, I think I used his death as an excuse to gamble. Like I remember thinking no one's going to judge me for gambling right now. Mm. So I could totally get away with it. Mm. And to fund that gambling, I took out one of those ridiculous loans where the interest rate is, off the charts, like literally the loan was for 20, 2000 bucks. And if you pay the minimum payment on that $2,000 loan, you end up paying back $48,000. And that's no joke. That interest rate was insane. It was like 400%. It was a totally like shady thing, but it was legal in Michigan at the time. Since it's become illegal in Michigan and there was some settlement reached with them, but you know, with you get that mailer that says you were part of this class action lawsuit. Here's your $7 back. Yeah. So I took this loan. I told everybody that, or I told my, you know, eventually I, I copped to it right away. I was like, mom, I gambled. Mom, I took this loan. Mom, for like the fifth time, can you freaking bail me out again? Mm. And, and, and she did. She, she, she paid off that loan for me. Uh, I mean, it was, I had just taken it and then I confessed. So, you know, she paid back the, the 2000 bucks. So no interest. Um, I had lost the money. And I had sort of still gambled here and there, but then stopped, like after I talked to her and she paid it back, I was like, okay, I can't, I can't gamble. And she said, Brian, you've always wanted to move to California. Cause again, like the comedy thing, I had dreams. And she said, why don't you just go? It's sad here. Just go. So, you know, I did, I, I made the effort. I told work I was going to leave. So we planned ahead and I just worked a ton of overtime to raise money. I cashed out my 401k, the $4,000 that was to, to take with me. And I got my car, packed my car, which is what would fit in the car, and drove across the country to move to California. Wow. But on the way, I stopped and gambled at a casino in Arizona. And then from Arizona, I stopped in Vegas. Right. And I thought, this, I can't believe I did this. And I pulled into where I was going to, I would move to North Hollywood. And I remember within the first week, I found a GA meeting and I went to it. And it was good. And I went for several weeks. It was different than Michigan. People were nice. And at the end of the GA meetings, it was like a quiz. They would point at you and ask you questions about what had just occurred. I was like, that's too much stress and pressure right now for me. No, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't go as often as I would. And then eventually, you know, I went to Las Vegas. I went to a four and a half hour drive from uh, Los Angeles to Las Vegas. And, you know, talk about anticipation. Four and a half hours of anticipating going to Vegas. I was on cloud nine. I, oh my God, that was incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and I did that about four or five times when I lived out there. I burned up all the money I had taken with me. And once again, put myself in a situation. And the last place I placed a bet was at the Bellagio on July 23rd, 2014. 
and I had done the most amount of damage to that point that I could possibly do. And I decided that I needed to, well, before I get to that, um, I was leaving the casino that morning, nine o'clock in the morning, I think. And I didn't know what to do. I was lost. Like I seriously, I, I, you know, like you were talking about your brain just being fried. I, I was so lost on what the heck I was going to do. So I called Chris. Uh, Chris lived in North Carolina. Or no, no, I'm sorry. He was in Michigan at that time. Eventually he moved to North Carolina um, within that year. And so I called Chris, the same Chris who told me I had a gambling problem. And Chris said, well, hey man, let me, let me help you out. And I think my words to him were, I did it again. And uh, he, he had called like a debt consolidation thing. You know, he was trying to help me, but he was also at work and I'm calling him in a panic, like solve all yeah. my problems on my trip home from Vegas yeah. back to Los Angeles. Yeah. yeah. Eventually I just realized like I've done so much damage and unless I want to go back to working three jobs and spend the next 10 years paying all this off again, which again is very admirable and I understand why people do it. But at that point in my life, that wasn't the answer I was looking for. I filed bankruptcy and I was very, I didn't want to do it. I just felt so dirty doing it. Mm. And after talking with the bankruptcy lawyer and, you know, just seeing what other places had filed bankruptcy, specifically uh, a casino in Detroit filed for bankruptcy and a casino I gambled at. So I didn't mind at all after that. I was like, you know what? If the casino can do it, then I can do it. Because yeah. I know where all this money went. So I, uh, I filed bankruptcy. I mean, it took a, a while to get it all done. And then I knew I had to leave California because just the allure of Vegas was always going to be there. And I just couldn't handle it. Uh, plus, I was out of money. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, so I, well, I was out of like my bankroll, but I could live check to check again. But not in California. It's too expensive. So the plan was to leave California, but I just didn't know when. Um, and I, six months after I stopped gambling, I realized I don't want to go back to GA and that it's not a knock on GA. I just like, I've done that and mm. it, it did what it did good or bad. It didn't work for me at the time. Mm. And so I needed something different. And I thought, well, Chris is always nice to me and he, he likes to talk to me about gambling. Maybe he and I could just talk to each other about gambling. And that's how the podcast got formed. Started six months after placed my last bet in January of 2015. And it just was me just talking to, he would ask me questions and I would answer them. It, I, I went back and listened to him once, yeah. I don't know, half a year ago or something. And I was like, Ooh, I cringe at like your voice and everything from back then. And just what you were saying. And but no, but it no, was, no one has a good first podcast, by the way. Right. No, right. Nobody, exactly. You know, you know. Um, but it was, you know, for me, it was therapeutic and that's all I was looking for. I, yeah. I started the podcast as a selfish way to recover. And honestly, to today, the podcast is still just my recovery tool. I'm, I'm glad people listen and it's fun to talk to everybody and talk about all this, yeah. but that podcast is my selfish recovery tool and it will remain that. And that's how I not, that's how I don't gamble is talking about it. And that's really helped me. Um, yeah. And it also helped moving across the country. I moved to North Carolina and slept on Chris's couch. <laughs> is that it's sort of poetic? It, yeah, right. Is, is that um, those first few recordings, were they taken on Chris's couch, as it were? Or was this? No, no, we were doing it over Skype at the time. Once a week, I mean, sure. it started once a week and eventually, you know, just like giant gaps in the podcast history. But uh, no, we were doing it over Skype. So I would just sit at my, my desk out in California and he would be in, I think at that time he had moved to North Carolina with his wife. So, yeah, uh, that's how it started. And he, he asked great questions. He was really good at that. Um, yeah. Those early days podcasts where he was asking me questions. He would look stuff up. He was talking about the DSM before I knew what the DSM was. <laughs> so it was, it was really impressive. Yeah. And I'll never forget, he was, I don't want to get too much into money, but he was so shocked when, because he, he asked, you know, like how much money are we talking about? And he threw out a number. He said, like $5,000, $8,000. And I'm going, buddy <laughs> i don't i don't think we're on the same plane here what yeah you know i and i told him the low number that i would just guess after 14 years and he goes where do you get all that money and i said just add up your paychecks over 14 years where do you think that money comes from for sure for sure so for sure. you know it is possible to do a lot of damage and i never made anything more than the highest i was ever paid was 15 dollars 40 an hour while i was gambling and that was just at you know the last few years before that it was always you know like 12 dollars 10 dollars 8 dollars mm. i was never a money maker i was just a worker mm. Mm. wow so, yeah go on you go well I, so uh you know 
the the podcast, as you know, eventually evolved and Jeff, who you had on, and I listened to his episode yesterday, Jeff Wasserman, uh, joined me and it's, it's been great. It's been a, a lot of fun. I've met so many good people and, you know, just this past year, it was fortunate enough to turn the podcast into a business. So I don't have to, I currently a stay at home dad and I do it, you know, part, it's a part-time business I get to do now, um, yeah. watching my daughter and doing the podcast. So it's, <laughs> it's very unique. Yeah, it's cool, right? It's cool. I mean, and I mean, I'm sure a lot of my listeners will will be very familiar with you. Um, I'm sure, but for anyone that hasn't, Brian, I, you know, is, yeah, I've not got really. <laughs> what? I'm sure. I'm sure they won't be. I because I just you know. I don't know. I, Maybe yeah. I think you have your own audience for sure, and I I don't think there's a lot of. Yeah, there might be a little bit of crossover, but I think people would be surprised to learn they're like another one. Wow, cool. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? I suppose you get into your habits, don't you? You you, you kind of follow. Yeah. You follow, but I I mean I know there will be a little bit of a spillover, but yeah, I mean Brian's been very very modest. Um, yeah, I mean nearly two hundred episodes since January two thousand fifteen. Um, I mean it's just nothing short of incredible. I mean, you you are you are the founding father, um, of gambling addiction recovery podcast right i mean there's a bunch of others now i mean i'm very late to the party um with with the invisible addiction so i yeah. mean I'm, I'm just looking up in awe of you and just thinking geez if i can get to 50 i would be amazed so 200 is just like crazy well you i i take it you have a full-time job um it's complicated it's complicated okay. so uh, can't, okay. but i mean you have yeah. you have a life to live you can't just spend your days doing podcast i spend my days with a two-year-old all day and and you know for the last two years a baby and and mind you most of those episodes came last year during covid so mm-hmm. covid really you know like what else were we gonna do we could sit and record podcasts easily and more people were in touch with zoom at this point so it's just easier to get people on to talk yeah. and we started doing meetings and that helped i mean it, the 200 is anybody could do that everybody will be up there eventually plus you have a very polished podcast like the Whoa. the the sheet that you gave me with all the information <laughs> and you've got that intro i mean it's it's lovely and i'm more okay. of like i'm gonna record this and put it up as is i, I do a little <laughs> bit of editing but nothing fancy because i'm i'm more of like let's just get the information out there and let people yeah. enjoy what they enjoy Absolutely. but my you know my numbers aren't crazy good or anything i mean it's, it's a niche podcast right we're talking about gambling addiction you're not going to have like these joe rogan <laughs> podcast numbers yeah. i i hope man that'd be awesome if yeah, that yeah. many people were paying attention but yeah yeah you know, the people who want to find it find it and i think it's i think it's lovely they do I, everyone's so nice about it but i keep telling everybody i was like this is just my recovery too i'm yeah. glad you guys like it but yeah. this is for me yeah it's 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 very similar it's very similar so in terms of your guests i mean you've got you've had such an array of guests do any particular guests stand out for you? Oh man, uh, <laughs> that's uh, well. We we had this this really good guy named Alex Lewis on the podcast. If I recall, oh, God. From, uh, about, uh, I think it <laughs> I was, was July twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. no, we've, we've had a lot you, you were on, uh, and <laughs> was, you were great. Yeah. I was, I didn't know you at the time. Uh, Jeff said, have you heard about this podcast? And I was like, oh no. And then you popped on. You were fantastic. I, I was, I, I you was were super charming, ner- I was super really nervous. likable. Oh, very nervous. Tell. I was, I was quite, you were great. I, 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 I certainly had that feeling. We, by the way, we, we spoke off air, Brian and I, but you know that when the tables turn, you, you're the one, you know, where the, the, the tension yeah. is on and you're like, Whoa, I'm not used to this. Um, but no, thank you. But apart from me, apart from me, apart from you, uh, boy, the ones that stick out. Well, I, I tell you one that, that just helped get other people on. And that's sort of, everyone's lovely. I haven't talked to anybody who afterwards, I was like, eh. yeah, um, everybody's lovely. And it, you know, talk about it in groups there's the group of people who have lived experience and who come on and tell their story and you always feel for those guys and and girls excuse me uh people and the 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 thing that i keep learning is all these stories like i told you sad stuff sure but other people have other sad you know worse mm-hmm. stuff than i went through you know i'm lucky to what i went through i i think back and i go oh, that could have been a lot worse and some of these people were a lot worse and so I'm, um, there's a guy who the podcast I'm going to put out, I was going to put it out today, but probably tomorrow at this point. Um, Sorry. he's on Twitter, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy folded on Twitter. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah, he and his we, partner we came on. Him. Yeah. Yeah, he and his partner both came on to do the podcast, and he walked out of the room at one point to, you know, they were both on the podcast, so he just sort of left, and I. I, I was talking to Charlotte and I said, I almost cried at what he was saying. Like I was very close to tears. Like my eyes were welling up and then he sort of stopped and walked away. And I was like, oh, I almost broke down there. Uh, his, his story was incredible. Um, so that I'm excited to put out, but judge Moss who runs the gambling diversion court in Las Vegas, she's retired now. Somebody else runs that court, but she's actively trying to get other courts brought up in the U S I had her on because Jeff knew her from a conference. Mm-hmm. I had the judge on and, uh, that having the judge on, is, then I could go to other professionals and I could say, look, look, she was nice enough to come on and yeah. we had a lovely conversation. Would you come on? And so that really helps. Every new person you have on knows somebody else. Mm, mm. We had um, mm. Jennifer Davis Walton from the West Virginia Council, Problem Gambling Council on, and she immediately suggested, oh, why don't you talk to this guy, Scott Anderson? And that's, I put his up yesterday and he's a comedian. He uh, is sober from alcohol, but he now is the, he's the um, gambling programs coordinator for the state of Ohio. So he has so much knowledge and it was a great interview. Nice. Uh, there's, there's always great people. All the folks at, of course, uh, Gamban who come on are always yeah. good to talk to. I, had, I was fortunate enough to talk to Matt Zarb cousin. Yeah. He came on and um, just a lot of good people. And, there's a wealth of it over, over, you know, in the UK where you're at, there's not as many people familiar with gambling harm over here. And I just think it, I was gonna it ask, takes time. I was, I was going to, I was just about to ask actually, Brian, can you, for, what's this, come on, what's the situation? Cause I mean, we've all heard that, well, I've certainly heard the liberalization of gambling in some States and it's kind of open and I read the paper here and it's like, I'm really fearful. It sounds a bit like, uh, but I am really fearful of what might be, potentially going to happen in america well listen Um, we're we're america and we do things bigger and dumber and i thought what happened i had no idea the harm that you guys went through mm. in uk i had no idea how much gambling there was until i started talking to you guys Mm. and you realize wow there were betting shops in every corner and people are gambling online yeah you know i was going to a casino if i didn't have gas money that day i couldn't get to the casino so you guys had online access and neighborhood, you know, tiny little bitty casinos going up. Yeah. And I had no idea that that existed. So what you went through, I, I get it now that people that we speak with are angry. Mm. I get the backlash because that was a lot of harm and just so much of it and constant ads and all that. We're just starting this. We just, since 2018. Crazy. They're, yeah. they're legalizing sports betting state by state and it's up to each state and they're going to do what they're going to do. They're, you know, it's a good way to make revenue and it's legal. So people do it. And it's just, it's just a lot all at once. You yeah. want to say, Hey guys, just pump your brakes a little bit, yeah. pump your brakes a little bit. So I, I, <laughs> I, I've used this before. I said, I think it's going to be a disaster. Um, but recently I think I've started saying because of the pandemic, I said, I think there's going to be an epidemic of gambling harm in the United States very shortly. And if you go on the problem of gambling red thread, you can already see people popping up from, even from Michigan where for, it's only been a month. It's only been a month and people are popping up and going, Oh my gosh, all these ads I've already lost my money. I'm addicted to this. This is insane. And it's only been a month. So, you know, I, I, I don't have time for people who, who wouldn't look at this as a bigger problem than what it is. Um, I would hope that they could have an open mind to understand that we experience harm and there are more of us and with more accessibility comes more harm. Mm. Now, again, I'm all for gambling, go gamble, have fun. If you can do it safely, if you can do it without causing yourself harm, if you're a, if you're a Chris Pruitt who can just do $20 and enjoy his night out, good. Yeah. That's yeah. what it's for. Yeah. But if you're at home on your phone and that's open 24 hours a day to you, yeah. that's just so hard to escape. Yeah. Um, you know, the casino didn't close. I was there plenty of times when the vacuums were out under your feet, you know, <laughs> and that was always, again, like a wake up call. Like, oh, what am I doing? What yeah. am I doing? Uh, but I had to leave a casino eventually because I was either out of money or, you know, I just been there too long. I need to go sleep. But if, on your phone, that's, yeah. I, I would, I don't know what, I would have done at that point. I'm glad I didn't have to deal with that. I, I feel terrible for the people today who do. What would you, 
what would you do to make gambling safer? Oh boy, you know, what would I do? Uh, Does, can it even be safe? Well, again, the, the majority of people can gamble. Hmm. I, I don't think the number is as low as the one to three percent. I think more people experience harm than that. And then of course you have that expanded affected others and those you affect and so you know one person turns into 10 people who have experienced gambling related harm to make it safer i mean i i think you would start by putting more thought before you legalize it in the state Mm -hmm. you know more thought into treatment but more thought into harm prevention as well you you tell me you've dealt with constant ads right you're a sports fan you're a football fan and there's this big movement by the big step to get all these teams to take gambling companies off their jerseys and i keep saying we're headed that way lebron james is going to be wearing bet mgm across his chest yeah. i don't know any day now i'm sure i heard, I heard golfers as well they're going to have it on their caps as well apparently right so. and, it, and it's like we look to i look to the uk and i go look we can learn from the lessons they're teaching us let's yeah. not go down this road but we're going to go down it what yeah. can you do to make it safer other than not allow it um <laughs> i would say you have to have it close a bar closes yeah. A pub closes. You got to go home at some point. And to, to keep that open to all wee hours, nobody has any business at a casino at four in the morning. And uh, somebody will, some jackass will be like, what about second shift people? What are, uh, whatever. <laughs> Don't give me that argument. Just be good people. Yeah. You know, why is a credit card machine in a casino? I have no business using a credit card to gamble. A credit card is me accumulating debt with interest. <laughs> And if it's supposed to be entertainment, why am I accumulating debt in order to have that entertainment? Why would that even be allowed in a casino? And now there's these cashless payments. Mm. So I, I think a closing time, I think no credit cards. You know, I'd like to see fewer ads for sure because there's mm. already, I've, I've heard so many ads in these states. I'm, the state I'm in doesn't have legalized sports betting, so I don't see any. Mm. Uh, and I you know, watch a lot of app TV as opposed to live TV, so I don't yeah. see too many of those ads. But I, yeah, I mean, I, I, when I started this, when I started really thinking about it a year or two ago, I used to think, have all the gambling you want, but just provide treatment for everybody who wants it, you know? Mm-hmm. But then you start to realize, well, that still puts the onus on us, the gambler, to, you got to self-exclude and you got to stay, what puts it all on us and it, nothing on them, nothing on the industry. And I, I think they, they, they need a little culpability and I think they have to understand gambling harm a lot more than they do. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I always hear like, oh, there's good people in the industry. Absolutely. There's good people everywhere. Mm-hmm. But the industry as a whole isn't going to change until those good people start speaking up and talking more. And I hope they do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And actually, just whilst I think about it, were you, when you were at the casinos, were you ever told like to take a break? Was, did anyone at any one point ever intervene? I talked about this in a meeting last night, actually. Uh, one time in Las Vegas, I was at the window for the third time. And I don't remember if this is the last time or the second to the last time, but I was at the window again, getting money off a credit card or over with, you know, out of my bank account or whatever it was at the time. And the person behind the desk said, are you, sh- are you sure? Like you could tell, she yeah. could tell that I was suffering and she sort of, you know, she said, are you sure you really want to do this? And I just remember it. Like I felt that honest moment of like, well, no, but, what else am I going to do at this point? My hole is so deep. The only way to go is to keep digging until I find the other side. Yeah. And that didn't work. Uh, so no, no one ever told me to take a break. Nobody, even my friends who knew I was out there gambling didn't really, I think, understand the amount of harm that I was doing to myself. You know, I, my friends had no idea how much I was gambling. Mm. I, here's a bad story. I went to, my, my buddy Mike got married. Uh, and he was getting married at Michigan State University. And it was really cool. It was in the football stadium. So it was this cool, beautiful wedding. The nice. week prior, uh, my friend Jason and I went to go to you know, hang out like the weekend prior. Like, hey, you guys, let's all hang out. And so we did. And they had tickets to the Michigan State football game, but I didn't have a ticket. And I was living with my parents. That was part of that time period. I think I was 30. And they left to go and i was like i'll just watch youtube or something it's fine i'll play video games whatever they left to go to the football game immediately looked up the nearest casino and it was gun lake casino and i think wayland michigan and i 
I went there. I didn't even like the games in this casino, right? At this point, I had my slot tastes, and this didn't have any of them. So I was playing these other games I didn't really like. So I wasted all this money that I was supposed to pay for my tuxedo for his wedding and for my hotel room for his wedding. With I, I pissed it all away a week before his wedding while I was at his house. And he got back, and I broke down. And I confess, I was like, you'll never guess what just happened. And I told him, I was like, I just lost all my money, guys. And it's so weird because I'm having this breakdown moment. And they were both just like, hey, man, it happens. Don't worry, I got you covered. And I was like, they just don't understand what I've done. Like, if they could see it all over time, they would have said, oh, but they didn't. They just got these snippets of stories. So, mm. you know, one of my best friends and I messed up the week before his wedding. And I never will forget the look on his brother's face when he paid for my hotel room in front of everybody. His mm. brother was like, what the hell? Like, why is the groom paying for your hotel room, adult? Mm-hmm. And I felt so shitty, so mm-hmm. shitty after that. I, I was like, I can't believe I did this. Now, my friend didn't care, but this is just the guilt and shame that I hold. Yeah. Yeah. I was so. going to say, um, I was going to say, like, what the shame, the guilt, like, the, what else did it? What else did it bring? Did you, did you experience, did you suffer like poor mental health or would you say, or was it just... I didn't give a lot of that thought to my of mental thing. health back then. I think a lot more about it now. I contacted a psychologist the other day just because, you know, this deep into COVID and staying at home and taking care of a two-year-old, I had a breakdown and I wanted to reach out because now I'm aware yeah. of my mental health. Now I'm like, oh, I need to talk to somebody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but back then, no, not at all. Um, I spent my 20s like just searching out pleasure. And that was mm-hmm. either going to the bar to find a hookup or whatever, or just, you know, dating in general. and or the gambling, you know, it was one or the other. Mm. And so it was all this wasted time that I just spent seeking out pleasure. So I think there was something to skew in my brain. I, I don't know what it was, but like you said, you messed up a relationship because of gambling. I, I just wasn't present at all. Looking back, like so cloudy headed. And I, I, I do carry guilt and shame for the relationships I had back then. Cause I think I just didn't treat people well. Mm. I mean, I, I was never like a, I didn't get any physical violence, none of that type of thing. I just mean, you know, and not mental abuse either, but just me Mm. being difficult and Mm. me not being present and not wanting to move things along further. And I just, I think I I wasted a lot of good relationships and, you know, burned a lot of good bridges too. And I carry that guilt and shame. I I just can't, I don't know how people are able to step away from that. I I keep hearing how to, but it just doesn't work. It sticks with me. Mm -hmm. I heard, um, I listened to Chris Lee's um, podcast. Uh, Chris Lee? Did. Chris Lee, Chris Lee um, from, from Scotland. I, I shan't dare do his accent, but um, I thought it was a really good listen. And he said something that was really interesting. Uh, discovery, not recovery. Yes. Um, would you, he was quoting. Yeah. Uh, was Martin he quoting Pat- Martin? Martin. Yeah. I think it was okay. yeah, quoting yeah. Martin. Would, would you agree? Would you agree with that? Is, that? is it more discovery for you or is it more recovery? I had never heard that and I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah. When I heard that, my eyes lit up. And I think I've stolen it since. But it's that idea of, oh my gosh, this is what life is like? I had no idea. And that's what he saw. He's discovering life. I mean, I'm, I don't get urges anymore. Sometimes I have a gambling dream and I wake up and I'm like, oh, that was weird. Uh, or you wake up feeling like, oh crap, did I do that? But, yeah. you know, I have yet to fix my character defects as the reason I gamble. You know, I haven't done any of that. Do you, do you, even, do you even want to? Just, do you know I what just, I mean? Like, I'm, so, I'm 38. Did you? I don't know. I, yeah. Are you? Are you my short, I'm 38. My oh, short, my short temper yeah. and, you know, my, my, my anger that I have, I, I just think is so ingrained in me at this point. And I don't want to be that way, but it's just like, that's the reaction your body gives you. And, you know, I don't know if I'm ever going to go down that road. At, at this point, I'm happy that I'm not gambling because gambling just caused me so much harm. And yeah. my life has been significantly better since I stopped gambling. And I, a lot of people say, well, you can't just, can't just have abstinence and be better. Or, you know, maybe they're not that harsh. But, you know, you got to do more than just abstinence. You got to work on you. Mm. But for me, just not gambling has made everything better and easier to take. Now, I've always been the short-tempered type, but now that I'm, uh, you know, a, a father and a husband, I try harder to 
but it still comes out. But I do, I, I try harder. I'm just more aware of it now, which I wasn't back then. I would just spout off. So I'm, I'm a little more aware now, but I, I've done very well. I'm just not going to gamble. Like that's my main concentration. If I have to then like, well, how am I going to be a better person? And what am I going to do to fix myself? I, it's too much thought for me. I mean, I try to be decent to everybody. And if, if there's people that I don't like, then I just try to avoid them. Yeah. And I've deleted several tweets before I've written, you know, after I write them, then I delete them because I realize this is just coming from a place of anger. What am I doing? Anger is not going to solve anything. What I've realized in doing the podcast is that if we don't talk, if I don't have people on from the industry, if I don't talk to everybody involved in this, we're not having that conversation. And you got to have these conversations. We're not going to fix gambling addiction without talking to the industry and saying, hey guys, um, mm -hmm. could you sit down with us and listen to us and maybe help us out here? Yeah. I, I understand anger, Adam, completely. I get it. Alex. But, but we got to... What? Adam. Did you say Adam? No, I said I, I understand anger, <laughs> at, <laughs> anger at them completely. Oh, right. Okay. I'm going to have to... Do, shall I delete this out? No, no, I won't. I'll just show you how sensitive I am. Who's <laughs> Adam? Who's Adam? I, I'm not Adam. How dare you? You might how have to... I just realized it's uh, the time. You might have to delete what? a lot of this out. Oh, no, no. It's cool. It's cool. It'll be a four-hour movie. Uh <laughs> Oh, oh anger. Yeah. I, you know, I, I just realized I'm not going to help anybody if I'm just angry. So uh, I, I, I'm, I am angry, but I try to contain it and, and have a decent conversation with some people. Hmm. I, I agree with you there. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I think you should, we should engage with the industry. We should have these conversations. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. You need to, I'm going to quote Mockingbird or whatever it is, you know, you need to set foot in someone else's shoes to see it from their side and et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, it, bitch. yeah oh, there we go there we go we had to study that we had to study that in uh secondary schools oh really oh but, really you know it was it was a bit lost on well certainly lost on me but it's like now i'm older i'm like oh okay yeah all right. <laughs> i get it i get it yeah. But yeah and most of these people they're just they have a job they're mm. just doing a job and they don't realize and so that you know that where we come in to say hey guys don't forget about us mm. Mm. i I do, I do, I do think um, they're perhaps like missing a little bit of a trick because I just think like you've got such a duty of care for your customers, clients, right. users, whatever you want to call it. Like you've got a really good opportunity to to do something good here, um, as opposed to just you know offering not a lot, as it were. I don't know. I'm getting a bit opinionated, which is which is quite rare for me. <laughs> Wait, I, I, <laughs> Trying to sit I, on the fence I, as much as I can, you know. Yeah, I mean, I've I've seen people, <laughs> I've seen people that I don't enjoy uh who, who work there too i've seen that as well but i just you know i won't have them on the podcast yeah, yeah. but you know people who are interested in talking about it for sure yeah. come one come all yeah definitely definitely so brian um have you got well i'm, I'm going to try and marry these questions together but like essentially advice or tips for others who want to stop gambling who would like to recover um what advice would you give them Start a podcast because we're all not gambling. Wow. And I, I know I'm saying that sort of in jest, but honestly, talk about it, write about it, put stuff out about it. Yeah. It's kind of the accountability works for me. Yeah. I do this podcast, participate in, in these support group meetings and stuff. And knowing that I do the podcast, if I have ever had this weak moment, I would think, well, how's this going to go? Right. So, it, it does work in that regard, just as simply as doing the podcast, talking about gambling addiction, I'm not going to go gamble. Mm -hmm. uh, so the same thing goes, if, if you're writing a blog, if you feel sort of accountable to somebody, that really helps. But anybody listening who hasn't told somebody, and I don't mean on Twitter or on Reddit, you need to tell a human being, I don't mm -hmm. care if it's a friend or somebody on the street, but you need to tell someone that you can make a connection with because they're gonna care about you. And that's what Chris did for me when I was 24. And when I didn't tell him, but he said it out loud to me. And even though you know, it took me a long time to get right, I still appreciate that he said that out loud. And at this point, I could reach out to so many people. So I'm, I'm blessed in that regard. Uh, but I think telling someone, you have to tell somebody. And honestly, I loved therapy. Sitting there for an hour with somebody just giving you their full attention. I mean, literally, this is my therapy, Alex. So thank you because I get to sit here and just tell you all my thoughts. And I don't, I've been doing so many interviews lately. I haven't just sort of expressed myself like this in a long time. So this has been 
really great for me to express myself. It really does help. You like you get it off your chest yeah. and then it, it does feel better. Money comes back when you stop. When you stop pushing it all out the door, it, it funds come back. That's not the worry. Um, but to get your mind right, it takes time. Mm-hmm. And that's the hard part. Those, those first days, those first weeks, those first months, that's, mm-hmm. you know, to anybody out there, my heart goes out to you, that's hard as hell to deal with that first bit. Cause you're, you're like every minute of the day, you're trying to claw to get through mm-hmm. and ignore your phone or ignore the casino or whatever it is that you're using to gamble with. Mm-hmm. And so that's the hard part to that. I, I say like, you know, do whatever you can to stop. I mean, don't ever hurt anybody, but do whatever you can to stop. Yeah. Whether, even if it's, I'm going to sit here and eat a box of donuts and watch 10 movies in a row. And I'm going to watch all the police Academy movies. I have the box set right over there. I'll loan it to you. Watch <laughs> them all. That's a good 14 hours of comedy that you'll enjoy. And it's 14 hours that you won't gamble. You can't, it, from what I've learned, you can't just like hop back in. Like I'm done gambling. I'm right back into life. Here we go. It, <laughs> like your brain has been, it's adjusted to this yeah. feeling of excitement and you, you really have to just step away from that excitement. And so I locked myself in a room for, for a long time to, you know, that six month period, I didn't go out. I, I, I was determined because I thought if I got in my car during that six months before I started the podcast and when I stopped gambling, if I get in the car, I'm going to drive to a casino. Yeah. So I just went to work and I came home and I was very lazy. And that like, I'm impressed by the people who can go out and exercise and like take out this and, and turn it into a positive. Like that's so impressive to me. I just wasn't that guy. And I'm more of the, I'm going to be lazy. I'm going to distract myself. I'll listen to music. I'll, you know, even if I had to spend, you know, money I didn't want to spend on some form of entertainment that wasn't gambling, it's still less than what I was going to spend on gambling. Yeah. So whatever you can do to not think about the gambling, to distract yourself, do that. Yeah. Go on a vacation somewhere where they don't have gambling. And everyone's like, well, I don't have money. I've been gambling. Yes, I understand that. But get away from it. Just get away from it. I moved twice to escape gambling. Yeah. I moved once to California and once to North Carolina. North Carolina, where I was in the middle, was brilliant because the closest casino was five hours away. I'm not going to drive five hours yeah. at this point in my life to do that anymore. So, yeah. yeah. Would you um, would you recommend therapy to everybody? Would you would you say that's like something that everybody should be doing? Or, I mean, again, if they're comfortable with that, I I think it's a lovely experience. Uh, but you have to find the right therapist. Right. And the nice yeah. thing about some websites on like Psychology Today is they have people on video now, so you get the idea of some who somebody is just from their words yeah. and their personality. Yeah. Uh, so I, I like that. Um, I like therapy because somebody's just giving you attention. You can say anything and, and you're not going to be judged. You yeah. just, any, all those thoughts that you have about yourself, you get answers to. Yeah. I had um, uh, Betsy Byler on this podcast. She does a, a podcast, uh, All Things Substance. Sorry, I'm, my, my, during COVID, my brain has been terribly foggy <laughs> in remembering any details of anything. But she came on and, you know, talking to a therapist. Yeah. I was like, this is great. I, I, I think we talked for three hours because <laughs> I just kept asking herself about me. Yeah, I took yeah, advantage yeah. of the opportunity. And yeah, it's, it's really something when you learn about it, when you learn about yourself from the point of view of somebody who doesn't know you, yeah. but who understands the way the brain works. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think it's a lovely experience. I, I would encourage anybody to do that for sure. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, um, Actually, one of the guests I had, Yoni, I think podcast, oh, I'm going to get this wrong. Was it four? Was it five? Was it three? I can't remember. Anyway, he's a trained hypnotherapist. And I, I think even in the podcast, I was like, are you one of those guys that kind of swings a watch and goes right, look into my eyes and, you know, clicks the fingers and stuff. But he was, he was amazing. He was amazing. And uh, yeah, I can, I can relate to that because for me, that was therapy as well. I mean, I also took therapy sessions um, and I just Googled like therapy where I'm from and uh just took some sessions and, and such like and uh it was it was all right it was okay but by the end of it i never told them about the gambling and i was like all oh, right she was like oh, you don't need to come back I was like, okay great i'm cured um so i yeah i understand when you say like find someone you connect with or you respect or you know yeah. What you need. yeah and if you have a best friend like i do who wants to talk about it on a podcast even better <laughs> there we go there we go um so brian are you okay for time? I mean, I appreciate we've gone, we've done a little, we've done a bit. I am. Are you, are you okay for time? I'm fine for time. I'm fine for I'll time. Tell you what, would you just give me like two minutes? I just, I got to take the baby monitor to my, my wife just got home. I just want to take her the baby monitor real quick. Yeah, that's cool. 
It's cool. And I'll be, I'll be right. We can keep going. We'll, we'll By that. the way, you said, you know, at the end, I might be a little like, oh, Alex, this has been incredible. I've had the best time talking to you. Seriously, I feel great about everything I said. I don't think I've ever had such a positive experience like this. <laughs> well, there we this go. This has been fantastic. I mean, you know, it, I just felt so relaxed speaking with you. So thank you very oh. much. I, I really, this is, I told you I had a bad morning, you know, as a stay-at-home <laughs> dad and a, and a toddler who's you know, telling me no. I was a little yeah. stressed out. This has been so relaxing. So again, thank oh. you. I'll be right back. All right. No worries. No worries. I should, uh, yeah. I should be talking to myself. Well, I, I now am technically talking to myself. Shall I take this opportunity to speak to you guys listening in? Is this going to be one big live take or will I edit this out? Who knows? Um, uh, well, what, what are your thoughts with, um, with Brian's story? Um, I mean, for me, I, I could really relate to the casinos and things like that. Could, is it something, I don't know, are you American? Are you listening to this? Are you thinking, God, oh, I can relate to the casino stories? Um, perhaps you're you know, not American and, and such like, but yeah. Could you relate to, to Brian's stories, a uh, story about, I don't know, you know, those, those fail, failed or the relapses as it were, just not giving up gambling, but knowing that you, it's not quite, the bug is not quite over. If, if you like, um, certainly happened to me quite a lot where you're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to stop now this time. And, um, you know, you might stop for a week, two weeks, a couple of, you know, a couple of months, but you just come straight back to it maybe because you've earned some money or you haven't got any money. I know there's this, this triangle that people talk about the time opportunity and access or no time access. I told you guys, this is true, true filler. I'm like, I need to be coming up with something really constructive here. Uh, maybe, maybe we should just play some music or as I say, this will get edited out. I'm not, not too sure, but um, yeah, I'm really enjoying Brian's story. It's, it's great to talk to him. Um, I'm almost like searching. It's this is where I can need a, a, a live interactive audience. So Brian's come back now. He's going to be like, what the hell? You're talking to yourself. Um, Brian, so you started talking as soon as I walked away. I went, huh? Yeah. What is this guy on? Um, is somebody else on there? I took it upon myself, Brian. I was like, I, I, can I fill in the gaps for two minutes? And uh, so oh. I just started talking. I mean, look, I don't know if this is going to make the podcast because it was true, true filler. Um, it was kind of, you know, when you, you need like, well, you need an audience. You need someone to be like, stick the hand up or, you know, like just. You're vamping. Yeah. There we go. Vamping. There we go. Vamping. Actually, let's talk about that. Bro, tell us about your improv comedy and the whole course and things like that. Oh man. That was like, you know, the positive, the, the podcast has probably been as far as like a professional experience, the best experience, but up until just recently before I thought that this, um, I, I this, this period when I was able to be on stage every week was incredible. I loved that. So after I dropped out of, I'm sorry, I didn't drop out. I got kicked out. After I got kicked out, you know, I was always fascinated. I don't know if you're familiar with something called Second City. So Second City started in, in uh, Canada and Chicago. And there was one in Detroit. And it's a improv and writing comedy inspiration, uh, inspirational, improvisational uh, theater where they will teach you. And it, it took me about three years to take every single class that they, they had offered. And it's cool because you meet a lot of people, similar interests, other people who want to do acting or writing or stuff like that. So for me, that was my college. That's what I did. And I got to go downtown Detroit. And I was a kid who grew up in a small town called Pinckney, Michigan. You can imagine that's out in the sticks. To go downtown Detroit every week for three years of my life was so much fun. Uh, Detroit's a beautiful place. I love Detroit. And, uh, it was exciting. Now, again, I was closer to gambling because I would go downtown and then there's casinos and there's, so that part didn't work out so well for me. But the comedy and, and participating in that, I noticed my gambling decrease while I was doing that because I haven't felt anything that got me as high and joyful as gambling, but comedy was damn near close. Mm. And I was, I was probably always a better stage performer than a standup. I had some good nights at standup, but I, I, you know, the guys who I started doing stand up with who are still doing it today and are professionals are incredible. They're mm -hmm. so good. And I realized that's when I sort of went, oh, I didn't do the proper amount of work for my stand up. Cause I was, again, like I was, I'm going to go drinking and try to get laid and all this crap. So I wish I'd put the work in, but being on stage on a good, have you ever seen improv? Do you ever watch it? Do you know what? I've never, well, a little bit, but 
Well, just can, sorry to jump in there. Can you just define what do you mean by stage performer to improv? Because I, I, I don't understand the difference. Okay. So stand-up comedy is simply a guy with the mic telling you jokes. Yeah. Every, you know, your Dave Chappelle's, your Jerry Seinfeld's, stuff like that. Your Eddie Izzard's. There we go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I, I kept it local. Uh, <laughs> improv is is this form where you're making it up on the spot so it's that old whose line is it anyway you go to the audience you know like, hey, give me a something give me a short form improv is you know give me a suggestion for a place and a piece of clothing it's, that somebody's it, lost or something it's what it's what i needed i was i was crying out for that just now on that the whole improv thing i mean I, I, like i said i still don't know if this is going to make the podcast i was just dying out for someone just to give me something but, ah, okay. leave it in at this point we're going right. so long at this point just leave it all we're in. just going to leave it all in god right okay yeah. let's just roll with we'll it, leave yeah. it all in the addicted oh, gamblers pocket. That was there, we go. there we go um so short form improv is that long form improv is bunch of people just going up I and mean, bunch it doesn't matter how many people you have but you're just doing scenes endless after endless scenes uh without any suggestion maybe somebody yells something out but overall you're just doing it and you learn the rules of improv so that way you can break them but you can break them with people who understand them mm. and the most incredible nights on a stage so I, I worked for this place called improv inferno as soon as i finished second city out of nowhere an improv theater opened up in ann arbor I lived in Ann Arbor. Mm. I lived in Ipsy, right next door to Ann Arbor. And it was like, oh my gosh. So I auditioned, I got in. And it was like, I mean, I got paid $20 every weekend. So it's not like I was making a living. That was the greatest moment of my life when they said, we like you, you're hired. And I was on this home, you know, performance group of this improv place. So every weekend we're doing, you know, two shows a night, three shows a night, depending on who's in what show. Um, the best show was the X show and that was the long form improv. It was supposed to be dirty because it took place at midnight and you figure everyone coming in is drinking or having a good time or whatever. And there's, there's, you can feel it when you're, when you're doing something that you're making up on the spot and everybody's in sync and it's just an incredible feeling. I, you know, you can't explain like an improv joke on this. It's not going to work. But a, a gentleman, Dan Izzo, who started the improv Inferno, who, uh, you know, I love to death. He and I did a scene where, have you seen the movie Deliverance? No. With the banjo. And so there's this famous song, it's dueling banjos. And it's, and they go back and forth. And it gets faster and faster and faster. We were two men standing at a urinal doing it with our extremities, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> yeah. uh, so one of us was going thud, 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 thud. And the other one was going ding, 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 you know, implying larger and smaller right and it was it, you know it was stupid yeah. but we were both in sync on it and we knew exactly what we were doing and it was so like you get off that stage you're like i can take on the world just from yeah. that little bit and so every weekend i was given this opportunity and by the way i failed many times I fail on stage all the time but it's also fun for the audience when you fail as long as eventually if you fail too much you realize maybe i shouldn't be doing this yeah which is i guess where i went but uh it was, it was cool. And also we were given the opportunity to write shows and produce shows on a stage. So just this giant creative jug that we all existed in and so much fun as a part of my, and of course you're all just hanging out and it's, you're all doing things together. It was so much fun in my life. And sadly, you know, it ended the, the place closed because the rent went up on main street and couldn't, you know, couldn't afford it. Improv theaters and raking in dough. So, mm. you know, it closed and everybody went their separate ways. Some of the guys went and, they started this place in Detroit called Go Comedy. It's actually in Ferndale, but uh, it's called Go Comedy. And I'm pretty sure it's running today. I don't know about COVID, but I'm pretty sure it's still going. Some of the people I knew are in Hollywood. I mean, I don't know them anymore. It's not like I have friends really? in Hollywood. Really? Hollywood? But, yeah. Well, nice. some, some of the people, I should say, some of the people from the Detroit improv scene are there. Not everybody I was on stage with, but people I, I know loosely, maybe performed with a few times. Really? Yeah. Yeah. They're, uh, yeah some of them have made it pretty far. I mean, we, we so, talking, and some of those stand-up guys too have yeah. made it pretty damn far. It's really impressive. Really, I mean, I mean, I can you can you are you okay to name names? I mean, I, I know it's a bit weird if I'm like, oh, who do you know? Like, come on, tell us. But uh, well, so I just want to I just want to point. Out, I don't know them anymore. Like, yeah, we're not. Well, you know, yeah. we're not friends. We you know we shared a stage back in the day for you know one or two times. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, but out of the great, I'll just give you names out of the Detroit community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Been on. Um. So. 
Sam Richards was on Veep, and he's been in a lot of things. Uh, and then, oh, Keegan Michael Key, Key and Peel. Okay. He was a teacher at Detroit Second City when I got there, or he had just left right when I got there. It was one of the, I think he was a teacher when I got there because he was on the main stage. That's what would happen is the people on the main stage would be the teachers, and that's you know like wow you're on the main stage. Mm -hmm. And then all these people I started out with, some of them got on the main stage, and it was damn impressive to see. Really yeah. cool. Nice. Um. There's some character actors. Um, did you ever watch Workaholics? No, no. Their boss, the female boss on Workaholics, she was a Detroit Second City person. And again, like I didn't know her, but she taught classes while I was there. And so you'd see her around and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, that dude, uh, that dude. There's a guy in The Daily Show right now who was a stand-up back then. And he was good. He was good. He actually, he crushed me on stage one night because I, my joke ended with like me saying hypothetical repeatedly and he got up right behind me. He said, Brian Hatch, hypothetically, you're a good comedian. And the whole audience laughed and I was like, boy, that was really good. Yeah, geez, thanks. Yeah. I think that was me checking the box. Like maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe I'm not oh, sharp no. enough. But I, I respect the hell out of those people who made it because they really worked hard. You know, there was a time in my life uh, where I was just, I was mad and I was carrying bitterness not towards them, but I wouldn't watch anything they did because I was just, it, it didn't, it wasn't that I wasn't happy for them. It was more, it just reminded me of the work I didn't do to True. achieve what I wanted. Yeah. And that was always, again, that guilt and shame, that feeling doesn't go away. And you yeah. think like simply like, oh, go do it now. And I thought that too, when I moved to Connecticut, I was like, oh, I'll drive to New York and start doing stand up again. But yeah. you watch these pros now and it's, it's a it's it's easy when you're like 21 and you don't have a care in the world to say whatever you want to get people to laugh when i'm yeah. 38 my viewpoints have changed and it's just harder i'm not saying you can't do it but i just don't think i'm in the same headspace anymore to be able to i wish i was because i really love doing it being on the stage in front of people was just yeah it was the closest i ever got to that thrill of gambling so yeah and what i was going to say what about um because again for the listeners benefit because you've done like live episodes you've done all in like live episodes so is that similar is that a similar experience for you in that we, did, we only we did the we did the one at the connecticut council i heard you and jeff talking about it um but we didn't it wasn't live to the entire world that day it was just live to the audience at the connecticut council and then we put it up as a podcast right we we hope to do some live ones this year hope to kind of move into that field but mm -hmm. no i mean it was virtual too so you just you're not getting any reaction mm -hmm. um no, I mean that that stage when you have a good show and afterwards strangers are walking by you and buying you drinks and high fiving you and just being like, Oh, that was cool. Yeah. There's nothing like that, right? I mean, I'm sure you get nice emails. I saw the quote that you have on the mail you sent me. I'm sure you get good things said about the podcast all the time. It makes you feel good, right? Yeah, no, for sure. That makes for me sure. feel good when people say that stuff yeah. too. Yeah. Um yeah. Yes, yeah, any sort of when when somebody gives you an attaboy, it's it's nice to take it. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Um Wow, my God, my goodness! This has been this has been a hell of an episode. But one I told you, I've had a great time. I've really, really enjoyed it. Honestly. I don't know where all this energy came from. I didn't sleep very long last night. <laughs> Maybe it's the coffee. I don't know. It probably is. Know. Yeah, I've been checking that. <laughs> no, I, no, I should be. No, of course, it's the it's the fact that you're the, you're doing the interview. Um, so Brian, I mean, just to kind of wrap things up. I mean, so one final question: What advice would you give a young Brian Hatch. Oh, I didn't know that's where you were going. Oh. I thought you were going to, you know, what advice would you give a gambler? And I was like, hmm, I started to think. But a young Brian Hatch? Hmm. Number one would be trust yourself. I, I, I was very easily talked out of everything. Still am, you know. Uh, trust myself, for mm -hmm. sure. Took a long time to build confidence. Doing the improv and having people believe in you and that helped that build confidence. You stop doing that, you start losing confidence again when you're not doing what you love um but I, I feel like i should say something to my young self as a as somebody who no longer gambles of course it would be it's going to get better but you know i was just this is what's crazy not crazy but this is just this is what it is about gambling you can tell everybody what to do and the experience you've had but until that individual has experienced it for themselves. I mean, I, I would hope that they listen and learn, but I'm sure you know, Alex, that it's, 
you have to experience it for yourself. And Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to stop gambling until I experienced the harm that got me to stop, you know, and that's sad. I wish that wasn't the case. And maybe that's what I would tell myself. But number one would be to just trust my instincts because I look back and I go, boy, I had some good thoughts and I just got talked out of it easily or I didn't have the confidence. And, you know, don't ever make, don't ever let anybody make you feel that way. Mm -hmm. It's our world too, right? We're all sharing it. So we can all have a voice. That's true. That's true. Actually, just to, just to nip back on your previous, the whole improv, are you, are you happy now? Do you feel like you found your calling? Are you happy? You're like, you know, look, I've got an established podcast. Okay. I might not have been a, an improv comedian or be, you know, are you, are you happy with your lot? So to speak? Yes, I am. I'm ha- <laughs> It's like, there's a terrible like tone. I just said like, yes, <laughs> nice. but let me explain why. Maybe not. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Again, like I love the fact that people enjoy the podcast and it helps. Um, but I do, I use it for me yeah, and I don't sure. want to gamble. So I use it for me. Um, there's much like you can't really, you can feel the void of gambling, but you can't like find that feeling again, or at least I haven't been able to. Hmm. It's hard to find that feeling of, of a live stage performance. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that's why I've been listening to so much music lately and watching a lot of YouTube videos because I've been watching just bands play music yeah. and that experience that I have, you know, none of us have been able to have lately of live music. I look back and, you know, I talked to you about drums. I look back, the other advice I would have given myself would have been play a, play an instrument because it would have helped in comedy too, but just play an instrument because music is beautiful. Music can take my brain to places that mm. alcohol and drugs and gambling never could. Hmm. You play a synthesizer for me, and I'm like, the thoughts are all over the place. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> but am I? I, I am. I am. I am extremely happy. But I do feel like I'm still missing that part of me, that performer part of me. Hmm. I mean, you know, yes, we're talking in microphones, but it's not like <laughs> you, know, you and I can see each other, but nobody else. They're all just listening. Um, so I just miss. I'm happy, but I miss that that piece. And, yeah. uh, actually when we moved to Connecticut, we had discussed possibly opening. I was always so inspired by what, um, Dan Izzo and his wife, Trish and their friend Sabrina had created for us in Ann Arbor at the improv Inferno. And it's just this awesome community to hang out with and, and just be creative with and just be yourselves really, yeah. uh, really inclusive community. And I would love to be able to recreate that where I live now is would be my goal and that would absolutely 100 percent yeah like that would be the shining light in the sky that i would love to achieve and that would do it for me i'd be like i'd have everything at that point and that would be incredible yeah that and that's not to slight the podcast i love the podcast and the audience everybody involved in it but there's there's that piece you know yeah. there's that yeah. just that little piece missing that i i wish i had i heard um I don't know if, if you've <laughs> status quo. I don't know if it's status quo is a band that you would have uh, heard of. It's certainly a, an English rock band. Um, but I heard, heard status quo, the lead singer. I've really got into status quo at the moment. People have been like, really status quo three three chords. But um, the, the lead singer, <laughs> um, he's like, he, 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 t- <laughs> he talks about, <laughs> he talks about um, like always having a carrot at the end of the stick. And he's just, he's just unable. He's like, it's just there. It's just, there. it's just out of reach. And that's what like drives you to do more, but you're never quite satisfied. You're just never quite satisfied. So um, I don't know if it's, if it's something to do with that. I don't know. I've, I've honestly, I, I find it hard to find that drive a lot. Like even as something as simple as I need to edit that podcast, I don't, I don't always have that drive in me. Mm. Um, and that's something I've missed. I've lost too, I think over the years is, is sort of that gung ho drive. Now I, I get inspired at different times of the day. It's really weird. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're just walking through the house and you hear a song again, music. And I go, yeah, yeah I want to, I want to do something good here. Let me, uh, yeah. Um, so I, I'm impressed by people who are constantly driven and it shows by what they put out in the world. Uh, I'm just sort of half-assing my drive and yeah. It's my baseline, my half ass drive. <laughs> well, um, I keep, I'm terrible podcasting. I'm like, yeah, we'll wrap up, wrap up. Oh, I've got one more because I just, I just. Yeah, this I'm is en- fun. No? I'm, I'm, enjoying, I'm it. enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. What, what are you listening to? What, what music are you, what's, what's the last song you listened to? You so know, the, that kind the of Foo Fighters have always been a band that was out there that I always respected, but it wasn't until lately that I realized how much I love Dave Grohl and just that human being that he I'm is and the whole entire dude. story from 
yeah. from the Nirvana and it's come out a lot lately. He talks about it a lot lately is then he just, he said, what a, a perfect example, a driven person. He said, yeah. well, that band's not there anymore. I still want to play music. And he went out and he created a new one. Mm. And so I, yeah, just the, the more I see of him just talking, not even playing music. And then I really have just enjoyed their songs by Foo Fighters lately. I didn't even know existed that I've really gotten into. Um, yeah. I love Rammstein. Chris and I go to Rammstein concerts. Oh, nice, nice. Oh, I, I, I didn't realize how much I loved heavy metal. I wish I had known earlier in my life. Yeah. But Rammstein, Ghost. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm big into instrumental. Like, give me a good movie theme. Okay. And I could just lay there for hours and relax. Um, right. This is going to sound really silly, but watch the trailer for um, Judas and the Black Messiah. Okay. Whatever music they're playing over that trailer yeah. puts you in like, it makes it feel like it's a Terminator movie, but it's a completely true story about, you know, a, a sad moment in U.S. Yeah. history. And it, it's just like that music is so incredible. So I, I end up, anytime there's a trailer with music and I go, oh, listen to that. I find the music, I download it. So a lot of weird instrumental movie trailer music. I love two cellos. Those, okay. those, those dudes who just rock out on their cellos. Same yeah. with Apocalyptica. Yeah. I'm impressed by anybody who can rock out at this point. I will watch anybody live. My, my, uh, my partner, Nicole, she loves country music and I'm mm. okay with some of it, but yeah. I don't care. If it's live, I love it. Yeah, yeah. That's one thing I'm really missing like a lot is uh, I, remember, I remember recently like just, well, I so say recently, like a year ago, 18 months ago, but just like the local bar, just, just playing music. And it was just so cool. I, I went on my own. I like had a couple of drinks and just, just like came out. My ears were ringing, but it was just like, this was just impromptu. Yeah. It's one thing yeah. I'm looking forward to. You know, we got, we, we were talking about it off air beforehand, but uh, Nicole and I got married in Ireland and the amount of live music there in every pub well, is so cool. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they'd all play the same set list kind of, but it was, <laughs> yeah. it was fun. A lot, of, a lot of Darius Rucker wagon wheel every night. But, <laughs> but it was really, it was just, again, live music. So it was cool just to be, I love just sitting in a bar and someone's playing music. Like to me, that, that's great. Yeah, totally, totally. Right. I really will, I really will wrap it up. So where, where can people find you, Brian? Apart from in a room, I mean, sorry, that was, that's, sorry, that was terrible. Right, shut up, right, shut up, yeah. No, I, I'm pretty sure you, you took my answer. I'm glad you said it. I didn't have to. Uh, uh, what is it, my? Oh, I'm uh, Brian Hatch all in on Twitter. Um, you can email me, leestreetpod at gmail.com, L-E-E streetpod at gmail.com. That's the podcast email. I've had a website under construction for three months, so I'll let you know when I, I get around to that. It's yeah. on my list. There we go. You know, again, that drive thing. And yeah. I don't really want that website because it, it'll help. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah, so that's where you can find me. I, I used to have Facebook. I don't anymore. I don't have Instagram. I tried Instagram for a couple of days. I was like, this isn't for me. I tried TikTok for a day. Oh, I yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I was like, no, you know, you, if you put something out there and you get no reaction, you're kind of like, I'm just alone doing this. Yeah. There's nobody watching. I thought TikTok would be good for you. I thought that might be, that might be your arena, actually, if, if you know, if anything. I, I think much like I enjoy this long form conversation that we get to have yeah um i enjoy a a video made <laughs> in the you know in yeah. that 1920 by whatever yeah. ratio that is that i i wanted to make movies for a long time like i wanted to direct a movie and you know when i was in california that is the one of the few things that i did out there that i was proud of i mean the movie nice. sucked but i raised a little bit of money online i made it myself went back to michigan and made a movie and you know it wasn't good. It was, it was okay. I mean, it was techni It was, you do that and then you really learn how to make a movie or just make it yourself. Yeah. And that's where I talked about earlier learning to trust myself. I wish I had done that 10 years earlier yeah. than at the age of 31, but really positive experience um, to go out there and just sort of make a movie. I tried to submit to film festivals. I got into one in Canada or something, but that was about it. And then it wow. sort of just died. What was the film about? What, what, what yeah. What was it? Oh, uh, well, it was one of the, for whatever reason, I was, I, I, it was called My Friend's Kid, and it's, I think it's the plot of another movie, actually, now that I think back. Uh, but it was, it was just like, get my friends together, and these people are going to die, and you get a baby, and then you want to get... It was an hour and a half. I mean, I made like wow. a full feature movie. Um, so cool. <laughs> editing it was a pain in the ass, but it was just such yeah. a good learning experience. If, yeah. 
the movie cost me like 2,500 bucks. Yeah. And so again, like a great experience. No one was going to look at that movie and be like, this is awesome. But I could look at it and go, wow, I learned all this. And so I want to do more large production scale video or, or even just somewhat production scale video. And, uh, you know, it's funny, like I can get on a stage, but I feel weird in front of my phone recording something for TikTok or something. It's, it's just not yeah. me. And there's, there's a lot of great people who, who do do that. Um, what's, what's his name on, uh, on, uh, Twitter, on, uh, um, Gambling mm-hmm. God, Nick. Oh, James. yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's great. He is yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's like, that's his market right there. That's not, yeah. I can't do that. No? Okay. All but right. he's great. Uh, yeah. It wasn't, was he on? He was, yeah. He was, right? yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, yeah he I was on so. in series three. Um, and it was just, it was a great episode. And it was because that, that was the thing. It was like, what's he going to sound like? Because no one, had, you know, at this point, we've not heard his voice. It's like, what, what's he going to sound like? So yeah. when you're talking to him, other, other hymns didn't appear and start talking <laughs> yeah. from different angles. And... <laughs> from the office or whatever it is, yeah. Um, yeah, he was great. He was really good. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see that people are branching out into those avenues in that because so, you're going to reach more people, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not a big Reddit guy either, but there's people on Reddit who, who are there to help people. And, uh, you know, credit to you for doing a podcast. Wow. about this and talking about it and getting your feelings out there. And, and again, I get to talk about it. people are going to hear me who have never heard me. And that's because of this. So thank you so much. Oh, you are very, very welcome. It's been such a pleasure, such a pleasure. Um, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's, uh, it has been truly, truly awesome. Oh, I loved thank- it. I loved every minute of this. Thank you. Thank you. All right then, Brian. Well, I will, I will speak to you very soon. <laughs> i always do that so if anyone i've given the i've given the game away i always do this inverted oh see you soon and the yeah sorry um <laughs> this is now just getting awkward I'm, people are just like can you just stop the podcast by this point we're just wanting to just we just wanted to cut but um no in, yeah. Let, let's let's talk about the term responsible gambling for the next hour <laughs> yeah right yeah. <laughs> yeah get your slippers folks do you say compulsive gambler pathological gambler responsible again gam- no uh Although that is a good conversation to have. Maybe. But I don't think we're going to get it done today. I somewhat don't think we will. I think maybe we'll have to bookmark that for another time. But um, <laughs> there we go. There we go. A part two later on? Yeah. I don't know if I could talk anymore. I don't know if I have <laughs> yeah. anything left. <laughs> That's it. That's it. I'm glad I'm not recording a podcast today. I don't, I don't want to be able to. <laughs> oh, I'm Romeo done. All right then, Brian. Well, this is really hard to wrap up. I don't want to say goodbye, even though I'm no... I'm you can just speak. press stop recording. I could I... just press stop <laughs> recording. <keep> <laughs> All right, I'm going to press stop recording. All right, here we go. Cheers, guys. <gasps> Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Lots to take away from Brian's story. How could you relate? Like Brian, did you gamble at the casino? Were you drawn into those fast-paced casino games like roulette and slot machines? Have you opened up to a close friend like Brian did when he spoke to his friend Chris and told him about his gambling addiction? Let me know. Let's start a conversation. Feel free to drop me a comment on YouTube, message on social media, or get in touch with me confidentially via email, info at theinvisibleaddiction.com. In the next episode, I'll be speaking to Jack Simmons, founder of Gamba. Really looking forward to hearing his story. In the meantime, thanks once again, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care, and I'll speak to you soon.